Hi folks, Kevin here. Well, today we're going to talk about the key line scale of permanence. This image I took from the Permaculture Research Institute website, and there's a really nice article, and I'll put a link to that in the description below. Uh, so what is this scale of permanence? Well, it's really telling us about how easy it is to manage some things. So it's relatively easy to manage soil, and I'm, and I'm using the term relatively, where you can't manage the climate. It's something that you know, takes millions of years to change the climate. Uh, and it is much more permanent as opposed to soil. So soil is easier to adjust on our site as opposed to the climate. So from there, we'll go ahead and proceed. So this key line scale of permanence uh, was introduced in the mid 50s by P.A. Yeoman. And that preceded the work of um, Bill Molson and David Holgram producing uh, Permaculture One in 1978. It's really just a sensible order of the design approach. So we start off with the most important thing. And before you even start with this, we need to know, know what our goals and objectives are. What do we want to be doing on a site? What's its function? What's its purpose? Once we've got it clear in our mind, then we need to know, well, where whereabouts in the world do we want to be, be? Do we want to be in the warm tropics near the equator? Do we want to be in a, in a cold or moderate uh, temperate zone? Uh, or do we want to be in a, in a more arid zone? So we decide what climatic area we want to be in. Then we decide, decide on the topography. What's the landform? What's the surface and the, and the shape? So do we want to be on a, on a mountaintop? Probably not. Or do we want to be on the mountainside? And that seems to be the most economical for us to purchase. Do we want to be in a rolling hills? Uh, do we want to be on a relatively flat area because we want to have market gardens and all? So it really depends on what our function is, the landform. And we can manipulate the landform some. However, it is something that is much more permanent. Then we consider the water. And the water, we really are always thinking about the design process. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but we want to identify where the water source is. Typically, in, in some design systems in permaculture, we use a hillside and we use the branches on the tree to show, geez, here they come down from these two ridges on each side of the property and they come down to the trunk, the main stream, and they run off the property. Now we want to interrupt it by putting ponds high on the site and uh, managing the runoff from the site. So we want to find the contour lines if we want to control the water and distribute the water on the, on the property. So the contour lines, and, and controlling the water, we may feed a pond very high on the site. So the contour lines are level lines. How do we figure out what level is? Well, you can use a water level, the bunyip. We use this in a, in a small basement area, and that's really small scale, depending on the length of your hose. And I, become, I believe it becomes pretty inaccurate the longer the distance that you go, depending on the diameter of it, and then it's difficult to work with. Or we can use an A-frame, and many permaculturists use A-frames. I choose the laser level. It's worth the investment for me with all the work that I do. And one person can use a laser level and shoot a site pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. Once you've shot your site and you know where the points are along uh, the contour line of, of the hillside or the slope, uh, you're putting stakes there for you to do whatever work you're going to do next. And, of course, the water design system is geared to meet our needs. So if you have a very tiny home on a very small section of property, you may do a roof catchment. If you have a large roof catchment, you don't want to put it into a 55-gallon drum. You may want to put it into a, into a larger reservoir or put it into a pond. Speaking of ponds, ponds can be used for irrigation. They can be used for storm runoff and they certainly can be used for, uh, for energy as far as keeping them high on the property so that you don't have to pump it when power is out. <clears throat> Excuse me. The lower the pond is on the property, the larger the ponds are. There's usually more biological life in those ponds. So if we're planning on growing systems and we need to be able to, to uh, irrigate 
the gardens, the orchards, the pastures, the food forests, anything that we're thinking about on site. Then the next most important thing in the scale of permanence is our road access. We really want to plan that out so that we're designing that we're going to be able to get to all of the important elements on site that are necessary. And in some cases, that could actually be aid in the water catchment. You have a nice little crown to your road access, collect the water off to the side, and run that through swale systems or, or irrigation systems into ponds and so on. Uh, again, the road access has to meet, uh, is got to be designed to meet the functions. So in some places, there may be large trucks coming in uh, or trailers coming in. And so you want to be able to have reduce the number of 90 degree, degree turns. In many place, places, you know, the road may run along a ridge on, on the property. So it really depends on what the needs are and what the topography of the land is. Trees are next down on the scale of permanence. The trees can live a very long time. Or they, you may produce, you may plant some trees that are relatively short-lived that, that are nitrogen fixers or that are uh, coppicing uh, materials so that you can chop them, chop and drop, building mulch. They can be used as wind barriers. Certainly that they can deflect the cold frost to keep them off your garden beds at nighttime. They can block those hot, dry winds of the day that, that, are, that will dry out the soil and create a greater need for your irrigation. The trees can produce fruit, nuts, fuel in, in the form of wood. <laughs> they can produce uh, building materials. They can produce sap for maple syrup. They can uh, create habitat, pr provide mulch, nectar, shade, all of those things that trees can do. Next down in the scale of permanence is the structures. And the structures are really, I mean, they're all taken into, into consideration in what the function of the, pro of the place is. So certainly there's your home, there's workshops, there's garages, there's greenhouses or other season extension, animal housing, depending on what your needs are in the site, what your goals, what your aspirations are. Certainly your structures, you want to have them built to last, you want to have good solar orientation, you want to have appropriate amount of shading, you want to have them in close proximity, you want to have the services that they need for that with the water, the waste management, and so on and so forth. Next down in the scale of permanence are our subdivisions and our fencing. And again, this is all dependent on whatever we're going to be managing. What's the purpose of, of the site that we're, we're creating? So with our subdivisions, we in many of these places, we're going to make sure that we need water there. We need to have a roadway access there, the tree lines to, to do blockage, to, uh, to stop some of those elements that we don't want, the sector analysis fencing to break up the uh, subdivisions into manageable areas uh, as well. So we can use farmscaping. So if we're having, you know, let's say uh, garden areas, we want to bring in the beneficial insects. The, we certainly want to bring in many of the other, uh, the toads, the, the, amphi the amphibians, the uh, other vertebrates as well, reptiles into, into the, to the site. So that creates habitat as well with our subdivisions and fencing. We may want grazing, uh, rotational grazing on site. And so the fencing can be tree lines, it can be uh, portable fencing, or it may be more permanent fencing as well. We may be doing market gardening like Jean-Martin Fortier or Curtis Stone, and we want to have plenty of uh, raised beds. So we need to have uh, these beds raised. We need to have an appropriate slope so that we get runoff from the area, from the, from the rains that are the, on site. We need to have it uh, so that we can get our materials, our tarps, our, our uh, BCS, our small uh, walk behind tractors. Whatever the function is, our subdivisions have to be able to have the appropriate uh, space and requirements to meet the needs. Soil, the least of, of, of permanence on, on site and the most easily manageable. So soil creation, we can do key line plow, plowing. Um, key, key line plowing is not anything like uh, the typical plowing that we think of in, in monoculture with the corn crops and the soy crops. Uh, 
they're turning the soil over. There's very destructive. It, it uh, destroys the the, uh, the structural integrity of the soil, the, the uh, microorganisms that create it. It compacts the soil. It in, enhances soil erosion. It leaves the soil uncovered. It allows seeds that were that weren't exposed to the soil surface now to be uh, exposed. So weeds as well. So key line plowing is really using uh, very narrow chisel-like plows that are set at various lap depths. So they start off very shallow initially, and they're just pr providing a little opening, a, a narrow ripping of the soil, not doing much destruction at all, but it's allowing air filled with oxygen and nitrogen to get down to the root zone, which feed all of the plants and allow the microorganisms to do their beneficial uh, symbiotic relationships with the, with the roots of the plants that are there. So it's a soil building uh, system. It's an irrigation system as well. So key line plowing is very good at building soil. Swales can be pretty good as well. We use them on our site. Uh, they can capture uh, material debris, uh, the leaves from the deciduous forests that fall over time and all. Uh, cover cropping is another way of building soil. Uh, rotational grazing, if done appropriately, uh, and I'm not talking about the big lots where you see all the feed animals there and it's all brown the ground. I'm talking about where an appropriate no number of livestock are, are purposely rotated, and it could be as, as often as twice a day, and put onto another small area where the crop isn't all chewed down to nothing. It's, it's, it's rolled over and knocked down, it's, stomp, it's stomped on, and their fecal and urine materials help to increase the nutrients to it and it enhances the soil development much more quickly than the thousands of years that it takes to build uh, soil. Composting is another way of building soil. Biochar is another good way of building soil as well. Uh, mulching, we use wood chips uh, to build soil. And so there are a variety of ways of doing it. So that's my basic introduction to the key line scale of permits. I hope, and this is really uh, basic, uh, but it helps to us to get an idea of what things are more permanent, what things are more easily to adjust on site, and allows us to first to think about what are our goals and objectives when we're looking for a piece of property. Even before we look at specific pieces of property, what do we want to have that property do for us And thinking long term? So if you like this video, please give me a thumbs up, share it with your friends, leave a comment please. Uh, I'd like to get some feedback on these videos. Are these helpful at all? Well, thanks so much folks and I hope you have a wonderful day. Have a great day now. Bye-bye.